Um, I think that it's difficult to accept that we've been sexually abused because the easiest way to respond to being sexually abused is to not be home while it's happening. To dissociate from it. You know, fly around the room, become part of the wall behind you, space out, blank out, block out, crawl into a space inside of yourself. Um, just totally leave. Uh, but what happens is that dissociation continues. The dissociation becomes a survival technique. The spacing out continues after the incident. And it's a lot of the dissociative responses that set us up to feel crazy from then on. And you can dissociate around other kinds of abuse too. It's not just sexual abuse, but sexual abuse creates more dissociation. And sexual abuse can have a greater impact in our lives because our sexuality isn't something that we have. It's who we are. And that's why people who've been sexually abused, we, we call it a damaged good syndrome. They feel broken. They feel dirty. You know, they feel something that doesn't seem to be able to be repaired because it's a core of our identity that got twisted and broken. But the other part is that not only can it be repaired, but in some ways, a lot of people who are sexually abused have never really been touched because they were never there when they were touched. They were somewhere else. Um, the dissociation is a gift. One of the problems with dissociation, though, is if you dissociate, especially in treatment, recovery, and, and, and therapy, is that you usually get beaten up for your survival skill. Oh, you're not in your feelings. Oh, you're off somewhere else. Oh, you're spaced out. You know, if you're dissociating during this lecture, I'd say just learn from it. You know, just see it, thank it, embrace it, because it's a way that you got through. It's a way that you survived. You know, and in some ways it can operate as an addiction. You know, it can be destructive in our lives. You know, but I still think we have to be gentle with it and embrace it, just as we do our feelings and other addictions. Gary? Yeah, what's the difference between abuse and molestation? Molestation, molestation is abuse. And different states have different laws that delineate different things and activities and ages as molestation and, and, and rape and sexual abuse and assault, sexual assault. Uh, but essentially, I would put it all in the category of rape and sexual abuse. Uh, incidentally, incest, too, is a concept um, that we think of as being just about family. Actually, incest is more about authority than it is about family. When someone has authority over someone else and they use that authority to sexualize that person, then that's an incest dynamic. That's an incest victimization. And it's also a rape. To use that. And, and, and abuse occurs where there's power differential. If there isn't power differential, it's more difficult for there to be abuse. You know, and the power differential may be age, it may be experience, you know, it may be role, you know, employer, employee. You know, but where there's power differential comes the possibility for abuse. And I'm not saying an employee can't fall in love and have a relationship with an employer and it always be sexual abuse, but when the employer uses the power to sexualize, you know, the employee or the pastor with the parishioner or the therapist with the client or the teacher with the student or the parent with the child or the adult with the child, you know, that's the abuse. That's the presence of abuse. And where that power differential is about authority, that's really the incest dynamic. Yes. You mentioned the intellectual incest and emotional incest. Can you define that? Um, I talked about emotional incest. You see, um, I don't recall my mother ever touching me, but I do recall being seduced by her. And I do recall ending up taking care of her needs and being a surrogate spouse for her. That's emotional incest. I'm going to talk more about that later. Okay. A um, couple more things about sexual abuse. We have this kind of idea that the sexual abuse victims are over there and they need these special help and programs and the rest of us are over here. And I don't quite buy it. You see, I think that the whole bunch of us have been sexually abused. And maybe it's more mainstream than we think. But what we really need to do is, I think, expand our view of what is sexually abusive. You know, first of all, I would say that all abuse is sexual abuse just as all abuse is spiritual abuse. Because all abuse breaks off our relationship, hurts our relationship with ourselves as men and women. And that's what our sexuality is. My sexuality is my relationship with myself as a man. And if I grew up, my dad is slapping me in the face on a regular basis, how do I feel about myself as a man? And is that not sexual abuse? If I'm neglected, if I'm made to feel stupid, you know, is that not sexual abuse? 
And so it all requires a healing of our sexuality. It's also spiritual abuse because it all keeps us from becoming the person that we are meant to be by our Creator. It's all throwing us off the path. And so it requires a healing of our spirituality. And since it's, it hurts us and damages us sexually and spiritually, that's why abuse is such a setup for addiction and the continuation of self-abuse. Um, I think that there's some things that are sexually abusive that we often don't see as sexually abusive. You can grow up in a family where you're being abused and you sort of get in the system of it and you react to it, but you don't notice it. In fact, I had a person who came in and said that she had been told that she was probably sexually abused. And I think like many people are told that whether they really are or not, you know, it's a big thing to tell people now. Um, but she, was, she said, you know, that my therapist said I must be an incest victim. And, and so I said, well, I said, did your dad ever touch you? She says, no. She says, I don't think he ever touched me, you know. And she says, well, he used to hold my hand. I said, well, how did he hold your hand? She said, oh, he just held my hand. I said, you can't show us? She said, no, he just held my hand. I said, well, if I came over there and held your hand now, would you tell me, show me how he held your hand? And she just bolted right out of the group. She headed for a corner. You know, and I, you know, I, I really pulled back. I said, well, with your hands, show me what your dad did. And what dad did was molested her. You know, it was like very sexual, seductive hand-holding. And I don't know if you, you know, have an idea of what I mean, but rubbing fingers and, you know, and, and, and real caressing and real seductive. Yeah, and that's all she remembered. My guess is that there was more than that, you know. And she was just in that program for a short term, but she was going to start continuing to work on it. My guess is that more would have surfaced. But you see, that is enough. That is enough. I've talked to people who don't remember anything physical other than that their father, when they hugged them, or an uncle or you know, someone else, when they hugged, the arms would wrap too far around and touch the sides of their breasts. You know, and they dismissed it, except they felt it and they felt slimed by it, which is a suggestion that it wasn't accidental, that it was abuse. It, it's also interesting because, you know, in one family, you know, like dad takes a shower and uh, forgets a towel, makes a dash, finds a towel, and you're there and you see dad. And it's sort of shocking, it's sort of funny. You know, dad's embarrassed. <laughs> he heads back for the bathroom with the towel. Um, another family, dad forgets a towel and makes a dash for the shower, but it's not exactly a forgetting or a dash. And you see that and you have a reaction to that that isn't funny, you know, and doesn't feel the same as the other. But the incidents look exactly alike, but they don't feel the same. You know, one person is giving a back rub to you, and you feel the back rub and you enjoy it, and maybe you even start to have sexual feelings in response, or something warm happens in response. Another person gives you a back rub, and it can be the same back rub from a different person, same kind of touch, and you feel scared, and you feel slimed, or you feel used. You can feel the felt sense of what's going on with other people around us. You know, and that's what happens, is offenders have feelings that the victim ends up being enmeshed in and caring. An offender will sh feel disgust or rage or shame or sexual, and then the victim will feel disgust, rage, shame, and sexualized. You know, and so it's like almost a f an emotional transference process. So a lot of what is abuse you know, you can't say, well, this is abuse. You know, in fact, I had several people come from treatment center and, and they'd had, um, uh, well, actually two in a row. They said, well, I was ritually sexually abused. I said, well, what was the ritual sexual abuse? Because I had worked with this person I had never seen. Well, my parents gave me enemas. And they used an altar, you know, like a, a table with a white cloth and they were both there and then they gave me these enemas and that was the ritual sexual abuse. I said, well, maybe it was just enemas. There was a time where people were believing in enemas, you know, and that, you know, they gave them to their kids, they took them themselves, and it's like a shitty job, if you will, and so two people <laughs> would be involved, and they put a tablecloth on the table, and, you know, it's like, and you do it on a table. And, and so it's like, I don't know that you can say because that happened, it was this. It may have been sexually intrusive and abusive in the sense that it creates shame and some fears, but it doesn't make them ritual sex offenders. 
you know, I think we kind of have to watch it with the terminology and the labeling process, you know, about who's doing what. Um, anyway, sexual abuse. Uh, wet, lingering kisses that feel uncomfortable. Having to sit on someone's lap where you start to feel used or, or scared. Uh, times where you're being touched or someone's too close and you start to dissociate and get scared. Um, and misinformation about sex. You know what all Catholic males were told was true? We'd all be short, blind, and full of warts. Um, <laughs> like, where's everybody? Um, I think that too much information too early, being used as a shield in parents' relationship. Actually, there's a chapter um, in Broken Toys on boundary violations that has a whole list of what is sexually abusive. And I don't know if you have the book or not. We have a few around, but, you know, it's like if you go over that chapter, just, it's like a checklist. And, and the checklist came from my own need for recovery. And, and, you know, it took me so long to identify what happened to me that I wished there had been a list where I could just check it off and then go deal with it. And so I decided there isn't, so I made one. And what I realized is that even though there is a list, you'll check different things off at different times in the recovery journey. But still, it is easier to be able to identify it and then to deal with it. It took me a long time to realize that a witness to violence is a victim of violence. And that I didn't get hit, but I watched my dad beat my mother. You know, and that was the same impact on me or a similar impact on me, maybe even more than being hit myself. Um, I don't have a lot of time left. I want to talk about physical abuse. Physical abuse is not less than sexual abuse. It's just different. And sometimes the, phys the sexual abuse is disguised as physical abuse. There was a woman in treatment doing her eighth week of a four-week program. And she was debriefing and talking about the physical abuse one more time. And I was doing some kind of just sitting in group and doing some training. And I started asking her very specific questions that had never been asked her before. I asked her what time it was, when it happened, what she was wearing, what the color of the room was, you know, what was said, you know, who was there, you know, and all the details. And she's answering them. And what came out of asking the details was that it used to happen right after school or right before bed. She'd either be in her school clothes or her pajamas when it started. And by the time it was over, she didn't have any clothes on. She was being beaten and her clothes were torn off at the same time. She was being physically abused but it was really a sexual abuse experience for the abuser. Uh, sometimes her mother was present, but usually not. You know, and so it was like she was working on physical abuse, but she had been sexually abused, and it's different. Um, I think that physical violence is probably the primary cause of cultural violence, crime, war, atrocities of war. Um, <coughs> I think that maybe four out of five of us have been, have experienced, in this culture, have experienced physical abuse directly. <coughs> Probably 80% of the people in the United States in their own families by parents. In fact, Richard Gellis did a study uh, in violence in America, and he found that uh, about three-fourths of all parents, when given a list of violent acts towards children, acknowledged those violent acts as having done those violent acts towards their children. Um, I think that most of what we, most of what we call physical, physical disciplining is in fact physical abuse. First of all, it's absurd to hit a child to teach them not to hit their sister. Uh, hitting children doesn't work, and very seldom is the hitting about the child's behavior, it's almost always about the parent's feeling. And it, it's like the kid irritates the parent. And the irritation is like a scratch that goes into a wellspring of anger and rage about other stuff in our life that we take out on our children. They are the vehicles for our frustration. And hitting a child works better than a martini to relieve the frustrations of a hard day. And we can do it in the guise of being a good and religious parent because we have the message of spare the, chi uh, sp uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. But that doesn't mean, not, uh, that doesn't mean you hit children with a rod. The rod is a concept, it's the rod of discipline. <coughs> that we need to give our kids discipline and teach them limits, but we do that by having discipline and teach and, and modeling limits rather than beating them. How many of you got slapped, pushed, spanked, kicked, whatever? Some kind of physical discipline growing up. How many of you did? Let's see. Almost all of us did. Question, how many of you are hard on yourselves? 
How many of you don't take very good care of yourselves physically, have a lot of balance in your life physically? How many have a tendency towards depression? Okay. Well, those are just a few of the symptoms of having been physically abused. It can come from other things, but the fastest way to get to those places is to have been physically abused. How many of you have talked about having been physically abused? Okay, some of us haven't. I think that's an important part of the recovery process because <laughs> nothing changes till it becomes real. And, and there's a tendency to minimize its impact. You know, the, bo the book Broken Toys, it's like you hit a child once, you break something in that child. And you can say, well, it worked. But maybe it's because the child got broken. Um, in, in fact, think about it. Your best friend, you're out there in the patio and your best friend comes over and they've had a bad day so they haul off and whack you in the head. Does that affect your relationship, your trust, your feelings about yourself? Imagine then if you're a child and the person that's responsible for your sense of, of safety and preciousness does the same. Look at the impact of that one incident. In adulthood, it's greater in childhood. And yes, children are resilient, but there is something about us that gets damaged in the process. Yes? Um, a while back, I, um, my mama, I said, well, if she remembered, because uh, one time my daddy hit me real hard here and kind of like popped my neck out of place and took an instant headache. Mm -hmm. Well, Daddy wouldn't let her take me to the doctor. So three days later, my aunt snuck me to a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked her about it. She said she don't remember that. How could you not remember? I don't, that's what I want to say. It's called selective memory, and it occurs in a lot of families. Sometimes the more dysfunctional the family, the less anybody will remember. And she says, Daddy didn't just hit you. And I mm -hmm. said, well, how's that supposed to make me feel better? Incidentally, the physical abuse is not just in the being hit. It's in the not getting immediate attention about the damage done, too. Not getting medical care is a form of physical abuse, appropriate care. Um, I have a question for you. If you're still kind of wondering, like, oh, my, you know, there's, we sort of have a national parent protection racket in our culture, you know, and, and the par parents are the largest offending group in our culture and the most protected group, you know, and, and there's a tendency to want to protect them, but this is not about blame. It actually is part of forgiveness process that I'll talk about with spirituality. But, but the thing is that if you had a child in the same circumstances that you were in, how many of you would, be, would by choice do exactly the same thing to your child that was done to you each time it was done in the same circumstance? How many of you would choose to do the same thing to your child? Choose? Or by choice. By choice. Choose. Okay, now, my question is, if it's not abusive, why would you choose not to do it? And if it would be abusive to your child, then it probably was to you. And you say, well, my parents didn't intend to do it. They didn't intend to hurt me. Intention isn't what makes it abuse or not. It's like I'm out in the parking lot, and you leave here, and you run over my foot. And then you come back because you forgot something, you run over my foot again. You wonder why I didn't move my foot. I couldn't. You ran over it, remember? Well. <laughs> Do I wait to find out if you've had driver's education to have my feelings about my foot being run over? <laughs> of course not. I have the feelings, I have the damage, and I have to deal with both. And I think that's the reality of our lives. In fact, imagine that you have this child that you're supposed to make precious and feel safe, and you're watching someone else do to that child what was done to you. How would you feel? How many of you would be upset to outraged? I have a suggestion be at least as protective of the child that you are as a child that you would have. Have those feelings about what happened to you as a part of your own recovery process. Make it real and then feel it and share it and deal with it. Jerry? What about people who have been sexually abused and then turn around and do that also? Yes, a lot of people will. In fact, if the victim bonds and identifies with the aggressor, they tend to get into the role of aggressor and then pass it on. Some will continue being victims, some will be collusive and enabling, some will be aggressors, and some will be a combination of all three of those roles. But yes, it is the way that violence continues, is the bonding process of the victim with the offender. And if you think about it, who has the power? I mean, if you're a child, you know, who are you going to hold on to and see as an image, as a model? Well, 
The victim in the relationship, probably not. The offender, possibly. You know, some of us bond with offenders and some bond with victims. Some of us identify more with the offending process and some of the victim. All offenders come from, the offender role comes from the victim role, or pretty much all. Um, now, being hit, being kicked, pushed, bit, shoved, that's just an aspect of physical abuse. There's a lot of other things about, like, the most common physical abuse, I think, in our culture is touch deprivation. You know, not being touched, not being held, not being nurtured. Uh, uh, I think that um, uh, uh, nutritional, body image, what we're told about our bodies can be physical abuse. I think being forced into excessive work, ex uh, violent sports, uh, can be a form of physical abuse. Not getting medical care, you know, not being taught and li you know, live in hygienic situations. Um, the, uh, uh, in fact, anybody in here have constant relocations in their life, move around a lot? Okay, I believe that's a form of physical abuse because our physical surroundings are very important to us. We're pulled out of one and dropped into another. You know, we disconnect and we have a harder time making the connection each time we're pulled out. And, and now in one family though, it might be an adventure and everybody grieves their losses and then they have this new adventure and they help get, you know, connected in a new place. That isn't usually how it happens. It doesn't have to be a physically abusive process, but generally it is. You know, even the rooms and the, and the geography of the places that we are are important in our childhood. And to be moved around a lot is to be it kind of ripped apart a lot. Um, emotional intellectual abuse, again, it's not less than, it's different. Sometimes it's more insidious and more covert and harder to hang your hat on. You know, it's like um, a lot of emotional abuse happens because people don't deal with their own feelings and you get enmeshed and act out those feelings. If you live with someone who's rageful that's smiling all the time, you know, watch yourself become rageful and throw tantrums and destroy things. Um, if you live with um, uh, people who have, you know, feelings that they project on you, they rage at you, it has a similar effect. You know, and that's emotional abuse. Being denied the right to talk about your feelings, the, you know, being given all the crazy rules that we have about feelings is emotional abuse. Um, having your feelings made fun of, being ridiculed, being teased, name calling uh, is emotional abuse. Uh, jealousy issues, um, uh, living with sarcasm, living with passive aggressiveness, getting the silent treatment. Anybody get that? Where they were you know, not talk to if they did anything wrong and rejected, okay, that's emotional. Abandonment is emotional abuse. Um, how about being compared to others? That's a form of emotional, a constant comparison with others. Um, you never, feeling like you can never do good enough. Excessive pressures to succeed. Intellectual abuse, always having your thoughts altered, uh, your um, ideas made fun of, always being told what you're supposed to think, what you're supposed to believe, or having to tell all, not being given any sense of privacy about your thoughts and feelings and ideas. How many of you left your family not feeling very smart? Feeling like you're dumber than other people, couldn't process information, couldn't learn? Anybody in here go back to school after you left your family? What did you find out? You were smart. Einstein once said, everyone's a genius. Some are just less damaged than others. Some of us also learn differently than we've been taught. And so, where does the fault lie? With the teacher or with the student? Um, I think that um, religious abuse, spiritual abuse, you know, real rigid religion, um, a fearful, scary, judgmental, all-powerful God that's going to punish us, uh, excess devil focus, um, over-ritualized religion that's outside of the realm of, of being able to connect and identify with it, a religion used to control and shame. Remember that the underlayment of a lot of religion is woman hate, and a lot of it rests on sexual shame. Um, I also think that there was one kind of abuse that I knew I didn't have, and I was so glad because about the only thing that I figured I didn't have, that I didn't have to work on, and it was neglect. I knew I hadn't been neglected. See, when I was growing up, Biafrans were neglected. In fact, I recently found my Biafra button probably worth a lot of money now. I could sell it and send the money to Ethiopia, I suppose. But um, it's like, I, that's my image of neglect. I had a family. I had food. I had school three blocks away. I had friends. I couldn't have been neglected. But something happened. I was 17 years old, and I got into a fight. 
And I didn't get into a lot of fights, but this one, I got hit right here, and my tooth was broken and hanging. I went to a dentist, my first trip ever to a dentist, and he says, your tooth is broken and hanging. I said, thank you, and I left. I knew that, and that was it. 18 years later, I'm 35 years old, I'm in a rugby match. Yeah, I used to play rugby. I played rugby for about 14 years, reenacting my family violence on a weekend basis. And so I got a forearm across the mouth, and it broke that tooth out and the one next to it. And I went to the dentist. He says, hey, you again. No, it was a different dentist. Yeah, yeah. I went to the dentist, and he, he knew me, and he says, Terry, I've noticed that tooth, but now that I look in there, he says, that thing has been infected and over-infected. There's so much scar tissue in there. He says, how could you live with that much infection? And oral infections affect your whole system. And I remember the pain. I'd bite on something, chip on something, you know, just knock it on something. And the pain would just shoot through my head. Eighteen years I lived with that. Would you say I was neglecting myself? Well, where did I learn that neglect? I started thinking about neglect. And I realized that not even being to a dentist before that is a neglect. In fact, we were supposed to have medical records and dental records, and I always skipped school, forged, hid, you know. I never had any. I thought a family doctor was a doctor with a family. I didn't know that you went to a doctor for anything short of before you died, you go say goodbye. You know, it was like neglect, medical and dental. And I lived in a middle-class community. When I thought about nutrition, I raised myself on Wonder Bread, mayonnaise, and ketchup sandwiches. That was what I ate and lived on. In fact, I remember the week they invented bagel bits. You know, because I went through them so fast, because they gave my sandwich crunch that my mom wouldn't bring them home anymore. She worked at a grocery store. You know, but it's like my brother had rickets. Nutritional deficiency. You know, <laughs> neglect. Spiritual neglect. We had religion, we went to church, but there was no sense of prayer, no sense of communion, no sense of guardianship, no sense of spirituality, no gratitude. You know, it just wasn't there. It was completely neglected. And I thought about academic neglect. My parents got me in school a year early, and that was the last I saw of them around the school until I graduated. You know, and, and it's like I thought parents helping kids with homework was cheating. You know, in fact, even when I had kids, I still thought that. They had to do their own. You know, I just didn't get it about the support and the being involved academically. Um, touch neglect? You know, in fact, I used to tuck my parents in bed. You know, and it's like, they go to bed, and if they were home, that is, and then I tuck them in, and then I go to bed. You know, and I thought, I've never been touched other than my touching them that I can remember. You know, and that's touch neglect. I also thought, well, when will I ever get tucked in? I figure I'll be in a nursing home paying someone about $1,800 a month to do it. You know, and by then they'll have robots saying, you know, clunk, you know, good night, Terry, and I'm out, you know, and they're gone. But, you know, it's like never having been touched like that has an impact. That touch deprivation is another form of neglect. Neglect is like repetitive abandonment. You know, and it's something that I, heck, I couldn't see all of the areas of neglect in my life. And you know why? I lived in a paradigm of neglect that I couldn't see out of. And I have this suspicion that since what we die of in our culture are diseases of lifestyle, maybe it's possible that many of us live in this paradigm of neglect that we can't see out of. And the only thing that helped me see that I was in it was looking at how neglected I'd been. Nothing changes till it becomes real. What this program is about is seeing, looking at, and embracing what was real. It's a chance to look at the ways that you've been neglected or hurt.